Welcome to Devoted to a Soldier Resource Panel, and the theme tonight is the Combat Veteran. And with me are two amazing men, Stephen and John. How are you guys tonight? I'm good, Danny. Yourself? I'm doing fantastic. I'm I'm ready. I know you guys have a lot to offer and a lot to give, and, and I know Stephen can talk, so. I can. But you know, uh, I'm going to try to keep it down to a minimum tonight because I want to hear what John has to say. He's obviously accomplished. And, you know, like we talked about last time, Danny, getting our Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam veteran brothers and sisters together, we can share a lot of that information that really can help help each of our, uh, you know, of our, of our year veterans out. Yeah, I'm super excited. So before we get started, I want to give you the opportunity to tell the world a little bit about who you are, because I know, but let them hear it straight from you. Um, we're going to go down the order because I like to keep it easy. So, Stephen, then... John, that's the order I see you on the screen. Well, I guess, I mean, first and foremost is I, I'm a United States Marine. I served in Iraq, uh, the invasion to Iraq, and then Afghanistan with the 22nd Mew in 2004 when we invaded uh, the Helmand province. Um, I broke my back on that deployment, and since then, you know, I've went on to write a few songs. It was on the radio Friday Night Fireside, Thinking I'm Drinking and Walmart Flowers. Uh, I was named the National Spokesman to Veterans Affairs and actually got to write the theme song, Hope for VA. So since then, I've just been working with Stop 22, the Romans Warrior Foundation, the VFW, uh, Irreverent Warriors, Heroes Vodka. I hope I didn't miss anybody. <laughs> You're a busy man, say the least. Busy man. Well, I just try to keep up with Andrew Farrier. I think we both know how busy he is. Oh, yeah. When he pops on here, he is. John, you're going to have to meet Andrew, and he is quite. He'll pull you into everything. You just wait. So... Definitely. I'm just, I'm just warning you now, John. But uh, tell the world a little bit about who John is. Well, John <laughs> is a uh, former Army, Army vet. I uh, spent seventy and seventy-one in Vietnam. I came back, uh, was offered a leadership position in the company that I used to work for before I went into the service. Uh, spent uh, 18 years with them as a supervisor, and then they downsized. This was in the mid eight, late 80s, early 90s. Every business started downsizing. I moved from company to company as a uh, uh, management representative, uh, skilled in startups, shutdowns, and financial turnarounds. So that lasted until 2013. I retired. Uh, we have a two-year-old granddaughter that uh, we're watching when my daughter goes to work, and uh, she, she's a handful. And then, Steve, we were talking earlier, you're, you're two-year-old and this two-year-old, you're a lot younger than I am, though. No. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, 97 Harley Davidson that uh, we take out occasionally, the two of us, and uh, that's it. We're both happily retired and carrying on. Yes. And you are an accomplished writer. You left that part out. I got to throw um, that in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. Have, <laughs> I've I published. Will, actually, we were talk, talking about earlier, a real writer, when you actually had to write the books, right. not dictate well, the books. Yeah, on typewriters when we first started. But uh, yeah, I'm, I published three books, two of them about my experiences in Vietnam. Uh, and this last one is what they call a micro read now. It's something you can read on a bus trip, 10, 15 minutes, and it's done. Uh, that seems to be the newest trend coming out now. So I'm working on a couple others of those. Well, that's my kind of read. I don't. I, I got a 10 to 15 minute span, and then I fall asleep. That's why everything's on Audible. <laughs> so, now, what's uh, a typewriter? You're going to have to explain that to our younger audience, I believe, because that's that's like saying a rotary phone or a hay phone. <laughs> I've, heard the, I've heard the same thing about can openers, not knowing how to use a can opener to open a can up. Shoot, that's right. that's sad. That's that's we're getting to be a real sad society, a can opener. Come on now. But all right, let's get yeah. busy because we have a short period of time and I want to make the most of it. So Stephen, as we talked about before, I am such a believer in generational learning, not just in our military, but in our society. You learn through the mistakes of, you know, our forefathers and the stories, whether they're real or not, they create, as my grandfather would tell me some great stories, um, but they 
create this existence inside you and this knowledge that you can't get anywhere else. So I'm very excited to have both of you here to um, to talk strictly on this. So here we go. So Dawn, I'm going to start with you. And I know you had mentioned to me um, that in Vietnam, you never were fighting to win. So can you elaborate on that? And then Stephen, I'd like you to talk about you know, your mindset during your tours and if that was the same as John or if it was different? Well, as far as winning, it wasn't so much personally. Uh, it was overall. We had our arms tied behind our backs. We had an enemy that kept running back into sanctuary areas in Laos, Cambodia, and we had to stop at the border. We couldn't chase them. We continued to fight over the same land over and over again. Uh, Hamburger Hill, which is a famous battle that they had in, in uh, Vietnam. 10 days of going up the hill, 10 days of getting beat down. We finally take it up. We stay there a week. We leave and the enemy moves back in and builds back up again. Uh, so those are the kind of things that, that happen. I think that uh, we had body counts that were the uh, measure of success and the higher officers, they were out for glorified, uh, body counts. They wanted to get their awards and so on. And we, uh, we ended up actually fighting for each other. So the guy on my left, the guy on my right, we were fighting for each other to keep ourselves safe. And, uh, whether we win or, or lost the battle, we accomplished uh, our goal if we walked out hand in hand together. Yeah, that makes perfect, perfect sense, especially during that time period. Yeah, Stephen, how about you? Like, so I got, I had the, uh, the, the duality of fighting, you know, in, in two different cultures. I fought in Iraq in, in the invasion when we first it, invaded Iraq. And then I also fought in Afghanistan in 2004, once we had already pretty established ourselves in Afghanistan. And in Iraq, um, the mentality of winning was there. You know, we, we had went in with a, with a true objective of a, of a time point that we wanted to get through Iraq. And I remember... You know, heck, I was a brand new Marine and uh, I still remember it being intense enough that we were, you know, we were gaining ground. So it, it's something I think, you know, uh, all wars are different. Um, the only thing that they're the same in is that it's chaos and he who controls the chaos wins the day. I think that we all know that. And it's, uh, you know, in Iraq, it was a complete different mindset. We were fighting a government in our minds. And so it was it was it was a push forward you know, take over a, a landmass, you know, um, area, which we had pretty close to no restrictions on. It was fight a war. And um, a lot of the, the, the leashes were let off of us in the early days of Iraq. Um, I don't know what it turned into. I never went back to Iraq. But then once we got to Afghanistan, I can fully understand what John's talking about. It was the same type of situation they would come out of you know there's a region in between afghanistan and pakistan that's kind of just a uh, we don't know who who owns it and uh except you know like he said you have your hands tied behind your back because we have to fight by a code called the geneva convention that a lot of people don't understand that our enemy uh from vietnam to afghanistan they do not uh, participate in these rules and so, uh, you know, we, we literally we've talked about it before, Danny, we're fighting a war with one arm tied behind our back because we have to abide by these rules. And so we can't go into certain areas so they can come out and attack you and go back in. Um, you do feel like you're just fighting for each other. Matter of fact, that's what it got down to. But right when the, we lost one of the first Marines that was killed in Afghanistan, Corporal Ron Payne, who was one of the greatest Marines I ever served with. And he truly loved the children and the people of Afghanistan was there to fight for a better, you know, way for them. But, you know, once he died, um, we all kind of just uh, realized that um, all we had was each other. We're in this mountain range. And if we want to get home, we've got to fight for each other. And that's what that's what we did from the whole time out of there. And, you know, we thankfully all made it out of there. I broke my back right after that and was uh, was paralyzed for a little while. But thankfully, I've gotten back to, you know, walking and doing some other things. So I understand exactly what John's talking about. But then I can also, you know, understand what a lot of the World War II veterans are talking about when they 
actually went into you know Germany because I think you know that Iraq was more of that in the invasion days where we had it's 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 just a weird your mind has to switch from month to month when you fight in these different regions because a lot of the territory looks the same but the the fighting and the warriors are not the same which brings me to the next I, can you talk about what it's like to be you know an infantry infantry in the infantry I believe, especially as a, as a civilian, you know, my son is, is the veteran. I am not. I'm just the mom of the veteran. But I believe that there is a disconnect between the civilians and the veterans. We just don't understand. No one wants to talk about it. Or they don't want to hear what is being talked about. But I find it is very important to understand what it's like to be in the infantry, whether it's good and bad or ugly. We need to hear these things. Well, I'm going to get made fun of if I talk about it like I was in the line unit infantry because everybody knows I was with 2nd LAR. I was a reconnaissance scout. We rode on vehicles. Um, I am an 0311, so I am technically a grunt, but I know all the, the 38s and the 16s the and all those true line unit guys are going to say, that guy's not a grunt. He's not in the infantry. <laughs> but, um, you know, I still had to go through SOI and ITB. And, uh, you know, part, being a part of uh, LAR was great. I loved the years that I was there, and I loved the work that we got to do as a forward reconnaissance unit and, you know, the battles that we got into from the Battle of the Coil all the way to Afghanistan. Um, I think for me, um, one thing, it, it's um, – I, I hold it as a badge of honor. I do I, – I think everybody that served in the infantry or served as an 11 Bravo or an 03 – um, thinks of it as as you're serving in the ultimate capacity of the military at the time that you're there. But as I've gotten older and I've started to figure out that, you know what, uh, we can only go so far without that supply element uh, back there keeping you going. When I started running my own business and started getting out on the road and, you know, we're doing shows, but we have to have the lighting guy and we have to have the sound guy and we have to have those people that are keeping us moving. So you start to understand a little bit more uh, I think as you get older, as you start moving your own businesses or maybe even get older in the military. Yeah, well, that is the truth. And John, your book, Cherries, because I haven't gotten through it, but I've been reading it. And you give a great description of what life was like as a grunt, as a grunt. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to hear from your voice. Oh, uh, the as Stephen alluded to, infantry was uh, roughly 10% of the total forces. The other nine out of 10 uh, soldiers were supporting you, either artillery, supplies, logistics, whatever. Uh, infantry could not survive without any of those people. We were the ones that were out in the jungles, up in the mountains, uh, trying to flush out the enemy. We carried everything that we owned on our backs which was anywhere from 80 pounds to 100 and plus pounds. If you carried a machine gun or a radio, that was another 25 pounds on top of that. When I didn't do told, that. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody <laughs> told me that when you're up in the mountains and you're not quite to the top yet, which I could never understand climbing a mountain for two days, three days before you reach the top, where we had to tie ourselves to the trees at night to sleep so that we wouldn't roll downhill. And I would have never believed that unless I did it myself. And, and that is true. Sleeping on the hard ground with every known insect and creature known to man crawling around you, uh, you feel something snuggle up to you at night. There's no light to turn on. Uh, you dare not show any visibility because the enemy somewhere around you, he'll see you. So you just have to man up and wait until in the morning. Uh, then you find scorpions in your boots and a snake in yes. your, uh, you know, right next to you, absorbing your body weight and, or uh, so on. Hey. I got bit by a snake that was uh, 10 inches long, no bigger round in your forefinger. And I was in convulsions within 10 minutes of being bit. And they had a helicopter come, pick me up, took me to the uh, to the medevac, and uh, luckily I got the serum. He was the second most poisonous snake in Southeast Asia. They referred to they referred to him as two steppers, 
Uh, the one that's worse is a bamboo wiper. This one was called a bandit crate. And there's just, there's hundreds and hundreds of different uh, species of snakes and yeah. spiders as big as dinner plates. And I seen in Iraq, in Iraq the uh, camel spiders yes. that were as big as- Camel jumping color. spiders. Mm -hmm. That's no joke, They're horrible. Um, and I almost, I almost stepped on a viper in Afghanistan. And what you were talking about, the scorpions, that's something we definitely have in common. I can remember getting up in the morning and you would roll, you need to roll your mat up slowly because the scorpions would get underneath you for your body heat. And so, uh, and then also, uh, PETA probably don't like this, but you catch because the clear ones were the most poisonous ones. We'd catch those and then you could have like, because uh, Marines, you'd have to come up with games because you're not under, combat is like, 5% of the time and the rest of the time you're waiting for combat. So um, you have to have things to keep you entertained. I'll let your imagination go to where, what we did with the uh, combats that we would <laughs> combat. The yeah. Scorpions, yeah, we would yeah, yeah. Pit bull fights. Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> See, not everything's changed, changed since your time, John. <laughs> and being out in the, in the jungle, uh, walking around. A lot of it was triple canopy. It'd be in the middle of the afternoon and it'd be almost dusk uh, in the jungle as the uh, sun didn't penetrate to the ground. But uh, during the patrols, you knew uh, it, it was like walking through a, a spook house at the carnival. You know, you felt your way up through. You knew there was somebody hiding around the corner somewhere and he was going to jump out at you. And they say that you have two different kinds of perspiration, one from the heat and exertion and the other from stress. Well, the stress perspiration really stinks. And uh, after all, you're out in the field for sometimes up to a month. You may be in the same outfit that you left with. Uh, and it's it super salty tatters. too. Yeah, it might be in tatters. Uh, but yet you had to make do with what you've got. And uh, if somebody were to jump out at you, well, then it could end in your life. One of the, uh, Steve, you mentioned about World War II. I've seen an analogy where uh, there was a difference relating combat between World War II vets and uh, Vietnam vets. In World War II, it was said that soldiers fought for an average of 40 days over a period of four years. In Vietnam, because of the helicopters, uh, they can pick you up and put you on the ground 10 miles away uh, to help support somebody that got ambushed and then put you back on helicopters, fly you back where you were, you can get into another fight. And the average for Vietnam vets were within the 12 months that we were there, we were in combat 240 days out of 365. So, yeah, we had those periods of downtime where you had to do things. Uh, we might go three, four days a week, maybe two weeks without anything happening. And then all of a sudden it just bombs you one after another, three, four times in a single day. Uh, that's kind of what the infantry did and what, what she had to live up with. Wow, that's a different picture. Two, to, two different pictures. I mean, similar, but very, very different at the um, same time. You know, I believe in our, our subconscious, right? We think what we think, we usually think day after day after day. It just sits in our subconscious and sometimes we don't even realize that we're thinking it, but it creates these patterns that we live in and so i have to say like were there times when you thought like i don't know if i'm if i'm gonna make it out i don't know if i'm gonna see tomorrow again i mean did you feel that way did at any point you feel that way because i believe that still sits within you as a person well I'm i've got a funny that. story about <laughs> this or do you want to go i've got a funny i i can I, i'll turn this around to make it a little bit um the one thing I think that, you know, with combat, especially if you're going to be in sustained combat, is you've got to find humor everywhere you can find it because life's really serious. It's probably the most serious it's ever going to be. Mm -hmm. So you got to find it. where. So first battle I'm ever in, ever, in my life, and we're outside of Nazaria, and we get attacked. Uh, we're sitting in what's a coil, so all the LAVs are in a big circle, 
kind of protecting another unit that had been inside Nasria. And so we start taking fire and I've, I've, I've never experienced anything like this before. Here I am like 21 years old, I think maybe 20, 21 years old. And I'm hearing rounds go over my head and I'm like, oh my God, this is the first time it's been real to me. It's, this is really combat. And I had what's called a saw, which is a, it's a 240, it's just five, five, six. And it's a, it's, I don't know who invented it and I feel bad for him, but it's just a horrible weapon. It falls apart. The rounds fall out of it. I'm scared to death. And this thing's falling apart as I'm trying to like fire and move. And so we finally get in our areas of fire of a range and I'm hearing rounds come over my head. So I think, and this is no joke. I think, okay, so if I get shot in the shoulder, I can probably live. But if they shoot me in the head, I'm definitely going to die. So like I just started digging and I, I have a saw. So with a saw, all you're doing is like a Z pattern of your area. You're just doing this the whole time. And you, you're trying to get them to talk with the other saw. So it's blah, 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 blah. So I'm thinking I can do this without looking. I don't need to look. I'm going to dig a hole and put my head in the ground and then just keep doing the, the Z pattern. And then maybe I won't get shot in the head. I have no shame. I don't care. I have two comebacks and ribbons. I don't care. So I dig this hole and finally, you know, we bound backwards and the vehicles come in and do the work. And the next day, me and my gunnery sergeant are walking around, you know, we're doing uh, a, a scan of the perimeter after the combat was over. And I was like, that's my hole that I dug. And he was like, oh, that's pretty smart. You were going to cover your rounds up so that they couldn't see what what caliber we were using. And I was like, no, I was going to stick my head in there and hopefully they didn't shoot me in the head. And he was like, oh, you were going to ostrich, bro. I was like, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna ostrich. So that's uh, that's the first time I ever experienced combat, and and then that tells you just how scary it truly is. I mean, like I, I I considered myself a pretty tough guy before the Marine Corps, and then you know after going through all the schools you get to before you get to LAR, I thought I, I was prepared for it, but nothing can truly prepare you, prepare you for real combat. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing. There's no training. That is fact. Well, in, in my particular case, when I went through basic and advanced infantry training, I was actually <coughs> four months worth of training before they sent you to Vietnam. And the DIs just continue to tell us, you're going to die in Vietnam. There's no way around it. You're going there to die. So do what you can, learn what you can, try and support each other, but you're not coming home. So you went over there with that kind of embedded in your head. Um, you were, when you first got there, I mean, you were, you're naive, you're scared to death. Anybody tells you otherwise is crazy. Um, exactly. And you're shunned by, see, the difference between maybe Steve and, and my war is that we went over as individuals and you had, uh, guys that have been in your outfit for maybe 11 months out of 12. You had some there. I mean, however many days, uh, however many months you could apply to somebody, there was somebody from each month that was there. So when the new guy arrived, he was kind of considered liability. Nobody wanted to take him up. Uh, be with you, show him the ropes. It was because you're going to get me killed. I'm not going to be anywhere near you. Now, as Steve says, you get into your first firefight and you react and you find, and these peers discover that they can now depend on you. Well, now you're no longer a cherry, which is the title of my book. Uh, and you're, you're, by the time that you learn all the tricks of the trade, it's time to go home. And you're replaced by a brand new guy, and this whole cycle just goes over and over. Uh, for the 16 years that war lasted, there was guys that went back and they had two tours, three tours. There might have been uh, a year separating them, two years separating them, a lot of helicopter pilots, uh, professional people kind of did that. You didn't see too much of it in the infantry. But uh, yeah, going over as a group uh, had its benefits. 
And I don't know, Steve, if you want to add to that or not, I can't comment on that. Yeah, it definitely did. You know, um, and see, in Iraq, I was I was probably one of the newer guys. They had stop lost um, my whole battalion because we had to actually go out and fight with First Meth. I was with Second Med uh, Meb out in Carolina, North Carolina, and we had to go out and fight to support First Meth when we uh, when we invaded Iraq. So I, I understand what you're saying about being a liability because I was that guy. Uh, I remember um, a lot of the corporals that I had. You know, they were already supposed to be out of the Marine Corps. And yet they were stop lost. So they looked at it like, hey, man, I'm not dying because I'm not supposed to be here. If something comes down the pipe that's dangerous, you're doing it because you still got four years left uh, doing this. And so um, and then I also understand because by the time we went to Afghanistan, uh, most of us had been together at least since ITB, which is Infantry Training Battalion, or since we joined the, the fleet, which fleet is the, uh, the actual Marine Corps. And so we were pretty tight. We could clear rooms without talking. Um, we knew we knew every everything, you know, every little move that each of us made. And then we had, you know, had some younger guys that had joined on who, you know, we kind of felt the same way, I guess, against uh, how I was felt towards in, in, our, in, in Iraq is that, OK, you know, listen, you guys stay out of the way. We've got this. Um, and, you know, and then, as you said, as you become. Uh, closer and you get into more firefights and you get into more, you know, things that you have to do together, you start to trust them a lot more and you start to depend on them. And that's, that's, that's how you become, you know, closer and closer as a unit where you really, I guess, battle hardened. You know, it's funny. It's the same thing in business, right? When, but now you're dealing with your lives instead. When you go into a company, oh, it's the new guy and, you know, oh, we got to train him. We've got to do all this. We're going to waste time, blah, blah, blah. Same concept, except for just being a nine to five job. We're talking about life or death here. It's a, it's much more intense, and that that leaves something on you. Which I have a couple things. Brian's listening, and he said, um, "Yet yeah, doing these things make you who you are, and wouldn't change a thing. It's hard to comprehend until you've done it." And I know he's been where you guys um, have been, and Andrew's watching. February 14th, 05, first combat experience for Andrew. Yeah, it, it's true. It does it does change who you are in good ways. Um, I, I definitely couldn't handle business before I went in the Marine Corps, before I went to combat. You know, the thing is, is that combat has its difficulties, and then it also has its easy moments. You know, if you simplify it down, when you're over there, really all you have to do is wake up and don't die. If you're a team leader, wake up, don't die. Don't let these three other guys die. That's your job. And um, then you come home and you've got bills and, you know, stress and children and a wife and, you know, all these businesses, angles that because let mm -hmm. me tell you, in the military, the one thing that I loved about being in the military was if I didn't like you, I told you I didn't like you. And if you didn't like me, you told me that. And then we went into the tree line and we fought each other. And then guess what? We usually liked each other after that because we knew. That uh, if if times got tough, you would stand up and fight for what you believed in. You can't do that in the civilian world. Everybody's perfect. They're their own perfect butterfly. Nobody knows where their lane is. Um, and you get into business and you think that the politics are bad. And in, 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 in the military, you get into business in the private sector and you've got people who tell you that they love you and you're the greatest right to your face at the whole time they're still in front. Of you. So it's a whole lot harder to transition into this civilian uh a business world when you're used to dealing with a certain set of values and rules and leadership traits that you don't find a lot in other businesses that are owned by veterans that's why i say buyveteran.com <laughs> that is that is right john did you i'm curious did you was it kind of that same um mentality when you were in there you didn't like someone you told them and then you went and just bought it out yeah. Coming home from Vietnam, Vietnam veterans had a stigma. They were crazy. They were dope addicts. Uh, they could not be dependent upon. They killed kids and women and so on, etc. And it kept a lot of us from even getting a job. I mean, I was lucky uh, the government protected me because when I left for the military, the company was obligated to hire me back when I came back. And luckily, as I said, 
uh, because of my leadership abilities in Vietnam, being a squad leader and, and taking over a platoon. Uh, that was very interesting for the business people to see when I came back and I was immediately promoted to a position that they had the utmost trust in. But I talked to other guys that uh, we used to go to rap sessions and members of my Vietnam Veterans of America chapter that were really shunned. And uh, it, they, they locked it all up inside and they kept quiet for 10 years. Nobody wanted to admit that they were Vietnam that we all hid in closets. And uh, it's, it's ironic to say, but that's the way it was back then. Mm. Mm, I, I want to be the first one to say, welcome home, John, man. Uh, you know, that's one thing that a lot of us uh, that, that fought in Iraq or whatever, a lot of my buddies' dads fought in Vietnam. And, and one thing they were worried about was, are we going to come home to the same thing that you guys did? And, and, you know, I think that's a big black eye on our on our on our past for the way that you guys were treated when you came home. And, and thankfully, I think that we've learned as a society that you can you can disagree with the war, but you don't have to take it out on the men and women who are fighting it. And because of everything that you guys went through, man, we got a, a great welcome home every time that I came back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, I just want to tell you, welcome home, man. And thank you for what you did to lay out that ground before us. I really appreciate that. And I think every veteran that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan does. Oh, thank you much. Mm, very well said, Stephen. And I have to, we have to close up, but I want to close up with this, this last piece. Um, Cause I feel it's very important. You know, we learn through others, you know, that have walked the walk. You have walked the walk and there are those that are coming out behind you and that's essential for healing. But how do you help others heal when you're still healing? You well, you know, I, about it. that's, that's it. You have to talk you about have it. That's to talk it. about it. In, in the, the, the number one. Is, go ahead, Steve. You got the floor. No, I, I think that the number one thing you hit the nail on the head, John, you have to talk about it. It's, but it's the hardest thing in our in our community. You're talking about men and women who have been told we don't talk about it. OPSEC, you know, uh, loose lips sink the ships. These are all these ditties that we have for not talking about things that that may bother you, especially if they're if they're mission sensitive. And so you have to talk about it. But at the same time, like you said, how do you help others heal when you're healing yourself? And let me tell you, I fell at that constantly. I fell at it. Um, you know, I have guys who and sometimes will reach out to me and really they want to lash out. They need someone to laugh because if you hold that inside, it's just like a bomb. It's going to explode. and It's got to explode on someone. And I've always said, hey, if you need someone to let that to, you know, that anger out on, let it out on me. I can take it. But you know what? The, the truth is, I don't take it well. And a lot of times I might be dealing with something and then they lash out at me. And the next thing you know, I'm. I'm coming back. They're getting Marine Corps, you know, Corporal Sergeant Cochran. They're not getting the Steve that they saw at the, you know, Scott 22 event or something. So I fell at it constantly. And it's something I'm always trying to, to strive to get better at. And it's something I really have to work at. Um, thankfully, I got great guys like Andrew and Zach Jenkins and Travis McVeigh and guys that Andrew, uh, or, uh, Richard um, Fleet, guys that I surround myself that are older veterans, Sam Tate. They can help me navigate these fields. And that's why I really think getting older, you know, veterans like Vietnam veterans and Iraq and Afghanistan veterans together, we can only help each other out. I don't see how we hurt each other in any way. Well, in my time, when I came home, the only people we had were the Korean vets and World War II vets. And PTSD at that point was not known until the mid 80s. So you really didn't have anybody to lean on. Uh, when we wanted the camaraderie and we entered the, or uh, asked the VFW to be admitted uh, as members, they didn't want anything to do with Vietnam vets. They said, hey, you're not a veteran. You didn't fight in a foreign war. It's un we don't want you as a member. And that was one of the other reasons for going in the closet that I mentioned. But the World War II vets, the Korean vets, they solved their problems through alcohol. I mean, you, you could go to a corner bar. When I was eight years old, I had a shoe shine box. And I would go into the bars, and who was there at 3 in the afternoon? It was all the former vets. You went to the VFW, 
uh, back in the 70s, that place was filled from top, you know, to the rafters with people. They're all drinking. That's how they solved their, uh, they got numb. And mm-hmm. once PTSD was recognized and we then learned techniques on how to deal with it, it's never going away. It's always going to be there. But you have to learn the techniques on how to deal with it, how to live with it side by side. Because until the day I die, I'm still going to have those flashbacks. I'm still going to see the faces or the bodies of these people that a person like you, Danny, would would not understand. Uh, You see a show on TV and the policeman shoots shoots a guy. He's got a little bullet hole in his forehead or that's not the way it is most of the time. And what you see, uh, it's embedded. You'll never yeah. forget it. But you got to talk about it. And you got to be willing to share. And you have to have trust in those people that you're talking to that, yes, they will help you. Yes, you can lean on them. Uh, and they're not going to rat you out. They're not going to go ahead and give you a hard time for thinking what you're thinking. Mm. So we are taking it upon ourselves as Vietnam Vets of America to take the Gulf War vets and and Iraqi vets under our wing and help them through this period in time for them. It's 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 so well, you know, we it's we don't just learn from each other through the generations, we heal from each other through the generations and we need um just more support of that and understanding of that and not uh, poo-pooing or or saying that yeah that's a great idea but then not doing anything about it you know staying within your own bubble you you know reaching out to those that might not even see yet that they need to be reached out to and you know giving yourself a break you know my relationship coaching comes out a little bit but we're human beings you know we're going to fail we're going to have those moments so we have to can't also be hard on ourselves we have to recognize like shoot i didn't want to actually respond that way because that's not healing me or them but not dwell on those times when we're not so happy with ourselves because we're humans you can't be perfect you'd be god and then you'd be in the ground it's not your time yet so good point so that is that well guys thank you so much we've gone over so which happens because it's such an important topic and you guys have so much value uh, that you gave tonight. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, you sharing your heart and soul with everybody out there that is listening. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Definitely. And check out these guys. I'm happy to check out the music, check out the books. You will learn a lot and heal a lot. Even through that, I promise you. Um, So easy click and I will see everybody on the other side. Take care.